welcome to this wonderful fall morning here at church. You guys see the white stuff, I'm sure. <laughs> so, um, if you're joining us online or here in person, go ahead, stand up, sing some praise with us, because God is good all the time. <laughs>
soul Oh, my soul Worship His holy name And sing like never before Oh, my soul I worship Your holy name Sing with me The sun comes up
this time are dismissed for their classes. Uh, there I am. Here I am. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Right. Welcome. We are glad you're here. This is, uh, man, if you talk about a song, 10,000 Reasons to Bless the Lord, O oh My Soul. I hope you can name 10,000 reasons. And I think, frankly, most of us just kind of fly through life and we never stop long enough to think, what reasons do I have to give the Lord praise? And the reality is you have millions of reasons. Every breath is a reason to give God praise. Certainly one of the things we've been talking a lot about this month is grace. Grace is one of the great reasons to bless the Lord, to praise the Lord, because God's grace is amazing. I mean, we say that all the time, amazing grace. How sweet this sound, right? We say it, but I hope that we really get it, because God's grace is I mean, it's, it's life-changing. God's grace, it, it, as far as how it impacts our lives, as far as how it gives us a relationship with God, gives us a possibility to be in relationship with God, it's just an amazing thing, and we don't want to take it for granted. So God's grace shows up in a lot of ways in how it impacts our lives. It's not just something theoretically that we know is in the background and so therefore enables us to stand with God. It is actually something that impacts and changes our lives. God's grace shows up in a few different ways. Number one, God's grace, remember, is foundational. Without God's grace, we would be stuck. We would be stuck in, in death, spiritual death, and stuck in our sin outside of God's pleasure and outside of his blessing, and we would have no possibility of getting it, no, no chance of being welcomed at God's throne. But with God's grace, we are forgiven. We are declared righteous. We are justified. We are adopted into his family, as mind-blowing as that is. God's grace is life-changing. Without the grace of God, we would remain separated from him. We would have, we'd have to depend on ourselves and our own good works and our religion in order to try to build a bridge. And maybe someday, hopefully, if we do enough, we'd have the possibility of maybe, perhaps, pleasing God. And the reality is we know we won't. We won't. We, we don't have, we can't. We don't have enough within us to do that. But with God's grace, we're given life. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God literally takes up residence within us and begins to change us. So God's grace is foundational. It's life-changing. And God's grace is transformational. It changes who we are. It changes us. It changes us from the inside out because now it's not me trying to please God by religious acts. It's the Holy Spirit of God within me changing my life, changing my motivations, changing my attitudes, changing everything about me. It is an amazing thing. With God's grace, we change our relationships with others as well. And that's kind of one of the things I want to talk to you about today. How does God's grace change you in your relationship with other people? And if you let it, it absolutely will, and I guarantee it. Again, remember, this is not simply, what we're talking about is not simply adopting a list of new and updated rules, okay? This isn't like, you know, instead of going to the synagogue on Friday night and, and observing Sabbath from Friday night to Saturday night and not eating pork, that we have a new list of rules. We go to church on Sunday, and we dress a certain way, and we do certain things. It's not a different list of rules, this blows the rule following thing right out of the water because we can't follow the rules well enough anyway. As we, but this is about walking with God, about letting God impact us, about letting him change us from within. And that's one of the things that we want to do in this. Rather than settling for the I for the, uh, an I mindset, rather than settling for sort of get them before they get you mindset of of. Uh, social media, we want to follow God and partner with him and let him work through us in our lives. The bottom line is this. 
those of us who have experienced the life-changing grace of God will, of course, want to show it more and more to other people. That will be a powerful testimony of the reality of our faith. As we start to show other people grace, it not only changes us, it changes our relationship with them, and it may very well change them. So the bottom line question we have to ask ourselves is how does the grace of God show up in your relationships? And you have to be willing to be honest about that. Does the grace of God actually show up in your relationships? Does it show itself in how you're treating people every day? I think there are three main ways it shows up in our relationships. There's, a, there's probably a million, but I'm going to talk about three main ways today how the grace of God transforms our relationships. Number one is God's grace enables us to be forgiving. Being forgiving is one of those things that a lot of us, you know, we, we know we should, but we kind of don't want to. We kind of want to hang on, in a sense, to what we have over people because they owe us or something. But anybody who knows that they are a sinner... Anybody who knows that they have nothing that they can do to pay for that sin, anybody who knows that they're in need and they have experienced the grace of God that then declares you forgiven and righteous in God's sight, of course wants to share that with other people. How would we excuse keeping it to ourselves? How would that person, a person who's really experienced this, how would that person exp th allow it to affect their relationship with others? Would they hold grudges? Would they bring up past mistakes and past sins all the time just to keep you in check? Would they keep you thinking that you need to constantly earn their love? No, of course not, because they've experienced something dramatically different, and it would change how they behave. Let me just read... Jesus told a parable. Of course, he taught a lot in parables. He told a parable about this principle that I just want to read to you. It's found in Matthew chapter 18. If you're taking notes, again, you might just want to write the whole chapter down. Matthew 18 talks about this kind of stuff quite a bit. One of the things we read from Jesus, it says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with the servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, <clears throat> one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay his debt. But the man fell down on his face before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. And then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and he forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to, to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars, and he grabbed him by the throat and demanded immediate payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me, and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt would be paid in full. And when some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. And then the king called in the man he, who he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? And then the angry king sent the man to prison and to be tortured until his entire debt was paid. So here's the deal. This guy was forgiven millions of dollars. He, he begged for time to pay it back. The reality is he was a servant. He could never pay it back. He begged, and the master had pity on him. And not only forgave him, but forgave the debt. And then he goes out, and he hands on, hangs on to a guy who owes him a few thousand dollars. Now, that's a lot of money, but it's nowhere near millions of dollars. And he refuses to have mercy, despite the fact that he has just been shown amazing mercy and forgiveness and grace. We, by the way, have been shown amazing mercy and forgiveness and grace. You and I have been forgiven a huge debt to the Lord. So how can we justify not showing forgiveness to others? You know, I read this week of a story that I had read years ago, but it just reminded me of this a story by a woman named Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom was a, a woman whose family 
hid Jews in Holland when the Germans were coming in. And they developed, they built a room where it was a, there was a false wall in her bedroom and it allowed like up to six at a time to be hidden behind this false wall. And it worked for a while, but they were betrayed by a neighbor. And so the whole family was separated and sent to various concentration camps. Corey was sent with her sister Betsy to one. And it was a particularly bad one. And Betsy died there, emaciated, starving to death and being abused, and Corey, of course, went through all that together. Well, Corey survived, of course, and after the war, went about speaking about the grace of God and forgiveness to everybody. And she, in fact, went back to Germany and spoke several times to churches in Germany about receiving the forgiveness and the grace of God. And she said it was interesting. When she went to any other place, they were enthusiastic, they were appreciative, they were talking and friendly when it was over with. When she went to churches in Germany, they were dead, cold, silent. And they would get up and they would take their stuff and they would leave and they, would, they had to be grappling with forgiveness. Can I really be forgiven? Well, one time she went to a church and she saw a guy coming forward. Everybody else was leaving. This guy was coming forward and she immediately recognized him. He had been one of the guards at the concentration camp where she and her sister were at. And he was coming forward toward her and she didn't want to make eye contact with him. She didn't want to talk to him. He came up to the front of the stage and he said, I loved your talk, Fraulein. He said, I don't know, you mentioned this concentration camp. I was a guard there. And since then, I've become a Christian and I've come forward to ask your forgiveness. Now, he didn't remember her. She remembered him. And she remembers standing there and she said, it was like ice water in my veins and I didn't want to move toward this man at all. I didn't want to shake his hand. I didn't want to grant him forgiveness. I didn't want to. But she said, I remembered that forgiveness is based on a decision of the will, not my emotions. And I knew that I had been forgiven more. And so I needed to reach out my hand. And it was like a mechanical arm reaching its hand out. And she said, as soon as our hands touched, I felt something in my heart that raced down my arm and into my hand. And it was like the Holy Spirit finally enabled me to actually forgive this man. And I could say to him, I forgive you, brother, from the bottom of my heart. And she meant it. And here's the deal. If you have people that you need to forgive and you have reasons that you think in your mind not to do it, you need to, you need to tr grapple with that. You need to get over that and you need to forgive. Many people say things like, well, what about my situation? My situation's different. First of all, I can't imagine a situation much worse than hers or than, by the way, Jesus or anybody else you see in the New Testament. Remember Matthew 18, again, earlier Peter said, so Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? And he thought he was doing great because the rabbi said three. So he doubled it and then added another one for the perfect number, seven. And Jesus said, Peter, I tell you not seven times, but 70 times seven. In other words, Peter, as many times as it takes, don't count. Stop counting and forgive. We are called to live in forgiveness and to rise above those who want to keep score. And the, the scorekeeping that we've grown up with, we're called to leave that behind and live in forgiveness. Romans 12 says it this way. It says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, <clears throat> give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That is one of the ways that grace shows up in our lives. It takes supernatural strength, not natural strength. This is not in you or I just to, to work hard and do on our own. We need God's work in us to do this. But make no mistake, the Holy Spirit can and will give you the strength to forgive. No matter who it is, you need to forgive. So forgiveness is one of the main ways that grace shows up in our relationships, but it's not the only way. God's grace also enables us to be patient. Patient is one, patience is one of those things that our culture does not specialize in nowadays. We are not a very patient culture. And it seems with the pace of things getting faster, we get less and less Patient. Have you ever noticed when you're driving on the road that the person in front of you is a slowpoke or a Sunday driver, the person behind you is a maniac, right? You are the only one who's right, right? Have you ever noticed this? It happens all the time. If you've ever been passed by one of the maniacs and then you catch up to him at the next stoplight, everything in you wants to look and wave 
And he's like, I'm not making eye contact. I'm not making, right? And you've been there too. You've been the one not making eye contact too. I know I have been. I'm projecting now. I'm saying you, what I really mean is me. Right. We are not very patient people. And it shows up in a lot of different ways. There was a woman I read about this week. She, she came up with something, she, a condition she diagnosed in herself. She calls it slowness rage. You've heard of road, road rage. This is slowness rage. She noticed it, ironically, while walking on a sidewalk with a friend who is really, really slow. They were going to a restaurant, and she had to keep stopping for this friend. She says, slowness rage is not confined to the sidewalk, of course. Slow drivers, slow internet, slow grocery lines, <laughs> they all drive us crazy. Slow things drive us crazy because of the fast pace of society. It has warped our sense of timing. Things that our great-great-grandparents would have found miraculously efficient now drive us around the bend. Patience is a virtue that has been vanquished in the Twitter age. We are not a patient people. I remember when I was a teenager, some of us, I finally had a job, and some of us older kids went together and bought my parents something that we knew was going to revolutionize their lives, and it was... It was a microwave. Now you might say, microwaves aren't that special. This was an Amana radar range. <laughs> this thing weighed about 1,000 pounds, I swear. But they, they were like, we don't need a microwave. We're fine waiting for our popcorn. We're fine waiting for our hot water for tea. But all of a sudden, their popcorn went from 10 minutes to 2 minutes. And their waiting for tea went from 5 minutes to 1 minute. And all of a sudden, things that used to seem very short, now we look at our popcorn and we still, if we're making popcorn in the microwave, we're impatient. We wish it could be faster. If we're, making, we're warming up water in the microwave, we're like, why is it taking 30 extra seconds? Really? I mean, we've become conditioned. Everything needs to move fast. We are impatient people. Patience, though, is one of the manifestations of the grace of God that we could all use more of and we could use to show it more. Remember that we show God's grace because God's grace has been shown to us. We have experienced it, and so don't, we don't want to keep it to ourselves. Remember, think of it this way. God doesn't give you a timetable to get right. God doesn't give you a timetable to become Christ-like. He doesn't say, Dave, you got six months. I've given you an extra six months to get to be like Christ. And if you're not there in six months, you're done. You're out. He doesn't say that. By the grace of God, because none of us would be in anymore. We'd all be kicked out. God works in us and on us our entire lives. His grace is always extended to us, and it's a good thing because we will need it our entire lives. If he, the God of the universe, is that patient with us, how can we be impatient with other people? Remember that famous passage on love in 1 Corinthians 13, start, verses 4 through 8, and it starts with, love is patient. Love is kind. So if you're going to show the love and the grace of God, you're going to have to show it through patience. Whether it's with your kids, or your spouse, or your coworker, or the driver in front of you, or the maniac behind you, or whatever... God's grace shows up in patience, and it definitely shows up in everyday relationships. It shows up a lot in your home, or it could show up a lot in your home. Maybe the opposite is what really shows up in your home. I mean, think of it. If you're, whether it's waiting for your wife to get ready because you're running late again, or whether it's waiting for your husband to finally finish that project he promised you he'd finish six months ago, if you just stop nagging him, right? Or, or waiting for your kid to tie their shoes again and again and again, because eventually they'll get it right. Whatever it is, there are lots of very practical ways to show patience in your marriage, in your family. And really, there's two ways to respond to any one of those situations. Number one is to be impatient and to sigh a lot. You ever known somebody who does that? It's like, what? Oh, I, nothing. Well, okay. Okay, you're impatient, right? Or tap the fingers, or tap the toes, or I'll be in the car, <laughs> revving the engine, right? Impatience shows itself a lot. It's not hard to see impatience. But if you could step back and say, you know what, I'm going to change this. By the grace of God, I'm going to demonstrate messages of encouragement. Yes, honey, you can do it. Let's try the bunny ear one more time, right? I'm going to show messages of encouragement. Honey, it doesn't really matter if we're a couple minutes late. Take your time. Don't worry. It's stress less, right? Because in most cases, it doesn't matter if you're a couple minutes late. Unless you have the key and everybody's waiting on you. Then you can be impatient. But, but the, the point is, patience shows up or can show up all the time. Mostly what shows up is impatience. 
And if we're called to be gracious toward anybody, we're called to be gracious to our family. So, once a, you make up your mind to be that encouraging one, that patient one, all of a sudden the pressure's off. You feel like, you know what, it's not a big deal. It's fine. What's more important is that you're not stressed and I'm not biting your head off because we're five minutes late. And so when you can do that, the pressure goes away. So God's grace enables us to be forgiving. It enables us to be patient. And finally, God's grace enables us to be gracious. And now you might say, well, duh, Dave, that's, kind of, that's not a very profound topic. You know, you, God's grace enables grace. Well, yeah, it does. But let me ask you, let me put it to you this way. How many of you know, and I'm going to want to show of hands, how many of you know somebody who knows all about the grace of God, understands the theological importance of the grace of God, has experienced the grace of God, but is not a gracious person? Anybody know somebody like that? Raise your hand. Okay, if they're in this room, would you stand and point? No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> just teasing. Don't do that. We all know people like that. People who have experienced the grace of God, but do not share the grace of God. They're rude. They're, they're impatient. They're sarcastic. They're cutting in what they do. We all know people like that, and sometimes we are those people. It's very much like the servant in the parable who has been forgiven millions of dollars and goes out and grabs his fellow servant who, owns, who owes a couple thousand. We have been forgiven much, and we tend to not be very gracious, or at least some of us. And now, the question is, how is that possible? How is it, it possible if a person has experienced the grace of God in these powerful ways, these deep ways, these undeserved ways, and won't show it? And they have a reputation for not being gracious. How is that possible? It's like the wires are disconnected. And it reminded me one time, recently, like last year, I got a new car battery, and I got it installed, and I got it home, and the next day I went out in my car, and it wouldn't start. I thought, I didn't drive far enough for a bad alternator to kill this battery. So what happened? So I opened the hood. Now, as a non-mechanic who opens the hood, I'm not quite sure what I'm thinking. I open the hood, and I'm like, I don't know. I, I, what, would I, what would I know, right? So I go, and I'm like, everything looks right. There's, I mean, I guess if there was a hose disconnected or something like that, some obvious thing, I would try to reconnect it. But I'm looking at it going, I, I wouldn't know how to diagnose anything anyway. So I go try it again. Nope, it's dead. So I'm like, okay, well, I'll, I'll do the next best thing that non-mechanics do. I'll jiggle everything. So I start to jiggle things. And sure enough, one of the poles on my battery is loose. It's in the right place, but it's just totally loose. It's, there's no real good connection. Somehow it got started for the way home, but it's not connected anymore. So I tighten it up, go, and sure enough, it starts right up. That's the thing. Some of us have our spiritual wires disconnected. We know and experience the grace of God. But there's something wrong. There's something disconnected that we don't share it. Why is that? How is that possible? I think there's three main reasons. Number one, we may have never really understood the depth of our need. We think we're pretty good. We think maybe other people need a swimming pool full of grace. I only need a thimble full of grace because I'm pretty good. And maybe we've deceived ourselves into thinking that, yeah, I guess grace is important and I'm thankful for it, but yeah, it wasn't too hard to forgive me, God. We don't understand. See, if I, if I don't really get the fact that I'm a sinner separated from God, then the offer of a Savior is not that big a deal. And so even if I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior, it doesn't change me because I think I was pretty good to begin with. That's number one. Another reason they might have their wires crossed or disconnected is they've nearly never given up their ability or their intention to measure up and to earn God's love. And as a result of that, they keep trying and keep working harder and keep disciplining themselves more, but they've never really experienced the overwhelming grace of God that says, you know what, you can't do it. Give up. Surrender and receive that grace of God. They're never going to experience the depth of that grace if they continue to try to earn it themselves. And a third reason people might have their wires disconnected is they haven't really learned, and many of us probably fall into this category, we haven't really learned to cooperate willingly and enthusiastically and consistently with the Holy Spirit work in us. We haven't let Him actively transform us. We're still trying religiously to conform ourselves. He wants to control, con conform our hearts, that is the emotions and the, the values, the things that we love. He wants to control our will, that is our minds, what we put our minds to, the, th the goals we've set, and he wants to control and to transform our actions. Every layer of our lives, we, he wants to transform. 
And he can, and he will, as we allow him to. And so some of us need to just let him do his work and cooperate with him. So maybe it means more time in prayer, more time in asking, Lord, what do you want me to do? More time in the word so that God, through the Holy Spirit, has stuff to work with in your life. That enables us to change our approach to others. When we start letting God's grace seep into every crack and crevice in our lives, it's like a dry sponge thrown into a vat of water. It soaks it up and continues just to be filled with it. And that's what we need. As we are filled with the grace of God, God begins to transform us and transform our relationships. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, we talked about a couple weeks ago, says, It is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not a result of works so no one can boast. But it continues. Verse 10 says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he prepared in advance. Part of the good works that he's prepared us to do is to share the grace of God, to be a grace agent in other people's lives. If you've experienced it, you have to share it freely. There is really no excuse. And I know some of you, when you hear forgiveness, when you hear patience, and when you hear grace, you think, you know what, that's just not me. That's not my personality. It's not how I was raised. Whatever. I don't care. And neither does God. Because the Holy Spirit wants to change you, and you can bet on that. No matter who you are, no matter how tough you are, no matter how tough your life was, the Holy Spirit wants to wash over you in grace and change you. And if you say he can't, you're saying the God of the universe isn't bigger than your personality. And I got news for you. You're wrong. God wants to transform each and every one of us. And can, and will, and has all the power necessary to do it. So if you're sitting there saying, well, I can't be patient, yes, you can. If you allow the Holy Spirit to work in you. I can't be encouraging. Yes, you can. If you allow the Holy Spirit to work in you. There's really no excuse. And if we are appropriately humble before God, due to our constant awareness of our constant need of his constant grace, then we will give up the excuses for being short-tempered or mean or crabby or irritable or whatever. Instead, because God is continually working on us, we will be transformed. And it shows up again in a million ways in everyday life, allowing somebody else time to develop, giving them the benefit of the doubt, putting yourself in their shoes, expecting them to treat you the way you want to be treated and treating them that way as well. It really is an ongoing invitation to experience that new life we talked about. In a very real sense, it is new life. Say new life. This is what God wants for you. New life. Not just warmed over old life. Not just, you know, religion in a different way. But new life where you respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit and he changes you. I talk to a lot of people after messages like this. Christians who say, well, God wouldn't expect me to forgive given my situation, would he? Or I can't be expected to be patient given who I have to, <laughs> who I have to put up with. Or, or maybe something like, I get that I should be grace, gracious, but there are limits, right? No, there aren't. Now, I'm not saying, and I don't believe God is saying, you need to stay in an abusive or a, or a dangerous situation. But most of us are far too quick to let ourselves off the hook when it comes to actually following through with what God wants to do in us. Many of us, even in spite of the grace of God that we've received, don't want to give it to some people. And God is calling us to do that. We think, we only think, well, that's not natural. That's not normal. I I mean, come on. You're being unrealistic. And yeah, it's pretty unrealistic. We're not talking about natural strength. We're talking about supernatural strength. But the good news is that God is not limited to what we consider natural. He wants us to experience the supernatural. God is supernatural and he can give us the strength from the holy spirit of god to do things that we would not be able to do normally the same power that rose jesus from the dead is living in you and transforming you the same holy spirit of god can and will give you the strength to live it out if you learn to seek him and submit to him and that's a big part of the new life the full life the abundant life It means consciously and and consistently putting off the old life and putting on the new life. Ephesians 4 says it this way. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted in its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. 
Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it might benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate with one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. So are you a sarcastic person or a critical person? If so, this is one of the things God wants to work on in you. Are you an angry person or an irritable person? If so, this is one of the things God wants to work on in you by his grace. He doesn't want you to try harder to outperform. He wants you to listen to the, the leading of his Holy Spirit so he can change you. That last verse, <clears throat> verse 32 describes a gracious lifestyle toward others. Kindness, compassion, forgiveness. He says, just as God in Christ forgave you. So let me ask you about that. Did God forgive you completely or incompletely in Christ? Completely. completely. Did God forgive you graciously or based on your goodness? Yeah. Did God forgive you consistently or inconsistently? God did it. He did everything Necessary. He didn't have to do any of it. You didn't deserve, neither did I, deserve any of it. But God did it consistently, graciously, and completely. Just as God has forgiven you in Christ, so you should forgive others in Christ. And this would be a great memory verse, by the way. Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. See, here's the deal. You and I are called to be agents of grace. We're called to be grace ambassadors to this world because we've received it, because we've experienced it, because we know we didn't deserve it, we can then share it. And if we do that, it will transform our relationships. Some people might recoil at it because they don't know what to make of it. Others will be attracted to it and want to know, how can you be that way? In particular, as God has changed you. How can you how, why are you changing? What has helped you? What has made a difference in your life? And that's the Holy Spirit. And this is how God uses you and the grace of his work within you to attract other people to him. So you make this week a goal to be an agent of grace. Allow him to change you. Don't make excuses. Let him change you. And he will for his glory, by his grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you give us grace that we do not deserve. Thank you, Lord, that you have given everything we need, everything we need for this life and godliness. Thank you that in your grace, you have accepted us, you've forgiven us, you've adopted us, you've sealed us for eternity. You've given us a relationship with you. You've put the Holy Spirit within us to work on us and to change us and to transform us. And Lord, help us not to let ourselves off the hook. Help us to walk with you consistently so that we show the grace that you want us to have. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
to say that I am thankful for the grace of God and for you Casey Sears because this is the second week that I've in this series forgotten to do announcements when I was supposed to do announcements. So thank you for your grace. I'm going to do announcements real quick while the band continues to play. Kelms of Gospel Mission, if you, I saw some of you bringing your stuff in, bring your feathers, bring your stuff in. This, pat, this coming Sunday is the last Sunday to do that, and I know that our turkey is filling in there, so a lot of you are bringing your stuff in, so thank you for that. You can talk to John out there if you want more information. Uh, next week after church, immediately after church, we're going to have a lunch for any of you who are new to KCC. We would love to get to know you. We would love to just treat you to lunch here, but you need to let us know you're coming so we can have enough food. So please, RSVP, you can use the little, uh, like there's a Get Connected card out there at the table before you leave. On the way out the door, you can use a little QR code to let us know or just email the office at office at mykcc and let us know that you're going to be there. And then finally, we're going to have our next steps meetings next Sunday and then two weeks from next Sunday. This is because we're in a position as a church that we need to take it another gear and go into a new direction, this is an opportunity for you all to have impact and input on how that looks, okay? As we go into some tra staff transitions, as I shared with you last week, I'm going to begin the process of retiring, and I don't know how long that's going to take, but we need somebody else to come in here and help, so we need your input on how to do that. So next week, you should have gotten one of these coming in. Next week at, in the evening, we will have one of these meetings. We would love a whole, full house there, okay? So let's go ahead and pray and wrap up today. Father, we do thank you for your grace and mercy. And we thank you that you give us everything we need through Christ. Lord, we thank you that you have changed us. And we pray that you would just help us to willingly let you change us even more. And Father, I pray that it would show up. You would show up in all of our relationships this week. And Lord, if there is a relationship that we have kept from you or we haven't shown grace in, just show us that. And I pray that you would just... Help us to change that this week. Father, we love you. We thank you that you are always gracious and patient with us. And we pray that you would help us to be, show that with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, you're dismissed.